This is a story Linda Behrens, Dr. Behrens, told me years ago. She studied under David Kersey. She was a graduate student in psychology, marriage, and family therapy. And she, as soon as she learned about type, she's like, oh, no, I'm an INTP. I, I shouldn't be a therapist because INTPs have terrible people mm -hmm. skills. And David Kersey was like, no, that's not the case because... I'm a therapist and INTP. Yeah. And he said, you actually come with different gifts. Like yes. you have objectivity, you have analytical models. Like you can reach and understand people in a different way if you work at it, if you work at mm -hmm. it, than say an INFJ would. Mm -hmm. And that gave her like the oomph to be like, oh, okay, there's a different way to do my profession and that I can do this. Welcome everybody and welcome Dario Nardi coming here today to uh, talk about your new books, Decode Your Personality and teaching tales for the 16 personality types. It's going to be a super cool conversation. I'm excited to hear your input on how the process came and how these books came about and how personality type has helped you. And um, hopefully by the end, we can get to some specific points for helping INFPs as well using uh, the information that you've discovered. Well, thank you very yes. much, yeah. Dario Nardi. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me. And um, for those of you who don't know, for Matt and I, our history goes way back randomly yeah. over the years yeah. here and there. And uh, if you happen to be in Tokyo in the beginning of April, then we may actually run into each other in uh, wherever. We have been talking for quite a long time. Um, yes. So, yes. Uh, yeah. I just yes. I wanted to let people know. And um, yeah, folks might think with all of the type information out there, why? have yet more books. Mm. Uh, what more is there to learn about type? And certainly in my mid thirties, I got to a point where I thought, oh, there's nothing really big to explore left about type. I'm going to move into some other directions. And that is a time when I got into neuroscience. Mm. Like many things in life, uh, what was past is not forgotten and comes back again. And so here we are. Yeah. And uh, with these two books, um, it's the first time I did two with once, yeah, yeah. Uh, which maybe sounds sort of crazy, but um, one was very much inspired at the last minute, and the other one was three years in the making and was a little bit of a slog towards the end mm. because I had done all the fun stuff. And yeah. so then writing sort of the bookends, the front and the back, it just felt like a lot of work. In the very brief, what are they like? What could be new about type? Um, the first thing is in Decode Your Personality. The name itself, of course, it's implying there's a four-letter code, or maybe some of you have used five letters, uh, that we want to figure out like what's behind the code to decode it. But there's another meaning, which is to decode something, like to de-anything, mm. means to remove it, to get past it. And so that's something I wanted to do also, that there was a way to say, hey, there's all these aspects of type, and, and let's find a way to bring in this case with nature and nurture type seems so much about nature which is fantastic yeah. uh it provides like a a home base in life but then what is this nurture side the developmental part like maybe we can just hand wave and say yeah every person is different but the brain research that i did for those of you might not know um you know the neuroscience research over the years since 2006 really got down to just sorting that and analyzing that and with the help of some students and encouragement of people um, to really in the process discover that the brain reflects our developed self. Yeah. Which sort of makes sense. I would I mean, hope so. Everybody has different <laughs> lives and different skills. Yeah, I would hope so. People who are hoping for something else, it would be very strange. Yeah, never changing. Uh, no ability to yeah, adapt. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, it, it was really, and then bringing in threads of other people's work. So Victor Galenko mm -hmm. from the Ukraine and socionics, very well known in socionics. Um, Dr. Helen Fisher in hormones mm -hmm. and neurotransmitters, uh, some other people in anthropology and, and connecting it with my own data and seeing, yeah, I think we could talk about four subtypes. We could talk about more. Yeah. Um, but four is like a good solid number that's supported by the data and already shows like a richness. Mm -hmm. And so what do each of those look like? So for INFP, you know, I've had lots of INFPs in the research study. I don't remember how many now, 35, 40, maybe 45. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are in leadership positions. They Good. are CEOs. Yeah. There are others who are musicians and artists. There are yet others who work in construction and in cubicles. And mm -hmm. um, then there are those who are therapists, for example. So I really feel with every type, there tends to be certain stereotypes. Yeah. There aren't all INFPs uh, 
what is it? The wandering artist with the unrewarded people skills. Sure. Yeah. Um, yes. The itinerant psychotherapist, whatever it is. Uh, and yeah, that version, that person surely it exists. Does, yeah. uh, it does, yes. Um, but yeah, just wanting to show the full richness of every type and to realize that there are creative ESTJs and ISTJs, that there are analytical INFJs. Mm -hmm. Um, there are ISFJs who are in leadership positions. Mm -hmm. What does that, what does all of that look like? Their brains are wired differently. Yeah. So just bringing that up and out to people and sharing that. So that's what that first book is about. That's great. Um, do you want to, we can stay with the first book for a little while and then we'll talk about the second one, or do you want to mention anything about the second book? You don't mention the second book. Okay. So that, okay, instead of three years gestating, it happened very quickly. Yeah. I was staying in London for last June for a month for the, the British Type Association conference. Um, not for the whole month. It didn't last a month, but I was there. That would have been nice. Uh, and I felt, you know what? I'm in Britain. I'm in London. Like, shouldn't I be more British? And it's all fun to pretend to be British for a month <laughs> um, with all of the ups and downs that sure. implies. And uh, I was inspired to watch a few movies, topics about the British authors, mm. because Britain is known as a country that enjoys poetry and literature yeah. and encourages reading and fiction. That's where Harry Potter and not to mention so many other authors. So I watched those movies about the lives of uh, Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, mm. and um, also it suddenly slips my mind at the moment, um, Emily Bronte of Wuthering Heights. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially because Emily Bronte folks think she's INTJ preferences. Mm. Uh, and then Mary Shelley, INFP. Um, and it was just so much fun, like, watching those movies. Mm. And I really felt drawn into it. And I was playing around with AI at the time. Some of you have, may have heard of ChatGPT. <laughs> and, um, and, and sort of get this story, like, could ChatGPT write a story about each type? Mm. It's like a what-if question. Um, and by the way, no, it's not very good at writing stories. Mm -hmm. Like it can write a story, but it's like a story you would write for, I don't know, a corporate memo. Sure. You have to be very specific yeah. with the instructions. It's like a fresh intern yes. that has no idea what it's doing. And you're just like, okay, do this and this. This is what I was going to do and pass it to them and then edit. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. adjust. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I did find it was very useful sometimes when I would get in a corner and I'm like, I don't know how to end the story. Can you give me some ideas? Mm. Especially for types that, where the story just needed a surprise ending. Yeah. Um, and, and so I wrote an INTJ story and an INFP story uh, and shared them with my INFP British friend who was there. And somehow that turned into 16 stories. Yeah. And I see, yes. And then, uh, and passed those around with some writing groups and getting feedback. And I sat on it for a couple of months. And the whole idea was not to illustrate the type preferences because it's very flat and static mm -hmm. and fiction is about drama and change. Sure. So I wanted to illustrate type development in only three page stories mm -hmm. and, and to give the energetic feeling of each type as it goes through a change, mm -hmm. as it goes through some weird challenge. And also Jung had mentioned that the, the moments of change in our lives are when there, there's something numinous about it. There's something, it's like weird. Something happens that's a surprise, mm -hmm. that's unpleasant, that's bizarre, that's spiritual, mm -hmm. that's whatever it is. It's a catalyst. Um, it's a catalyst, absolutely. And to then, uh, that it would be those kinds of experiences. So in a way, these are tales. Mm -hmm. They're not just traditional stories because they're meant to illustrate what is it like when a type, even a very rigid version of a type, encounter something that calls them to change like in the hero's journey it calls them and then they have challenges and choices and there are consequences and that's the four c's the call the choice the challenge and the consequences maybe not all at once and and then finally i was back in italy and i just had time to myself and i was sick uh, not terribly but enough and i was with my cousin infj mm. um and I just wrote 16 more stories because I felt one story for each type is just not right. Yeah. Like there's too much diversity within each type. Okay. And, and so then this little puppy was born. Yes. Ta-da. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. My, yeah. my copy is on the way. I know I mentioned before, but yeah, coming from America, it was difficult to get it over. So, but I am excited. Yeah. Amazon Japan supposedly should have it. And yet they don't allow me to order for you or for you to get it. Yeah. I had issues with yeah. author 
copies of some of my books as well in Japan. But um, the copy here, it was just my mom was sending a box anyway, so I might as well have her、Thank、send、you. it at the same time. Sweet. Cool.、Yes. Yeah, that's awesome. I definitely love talking about story and the hero's journey and development and、mm-hmm. um, how people can change just. From that little catalyst, as you mentioned, that little thing that happens that just shakes everything up、um, or、yeah. starts to loosen things、um, from a stuck thought to a process of thinking and change. Yeah. It's very cool.、Exactly. Excited to, to read those.、Uh, you might remember that I've written a lot of stories about different characters and superheroes based off different types, and it, it's a fun path to go down, and I don't think it's ever done. There's always like, I want to try another one, or could go this way <laughs> yeah, or this yeah, way, yeah. or is it really being true and honest to the character type and their development? There's a lot of things to process. And everybody's different in a way, even though they are sharing types. Yeah,、uh, yeah absolutely. I would say、um, one is to be fair to every type. It's part of the reason to have two stories. Very much as I was going to publish, and I felt I had the pressure of it because there was this personality hacker conference coming. I kept thinking of more stories.、Mm-hmm. There could be three of each type. And then I'm like, no, that's a future edition. It's just too much.、Um, the INFJ took the most rewriting,、mm-hmm. the second INFJ story. The first one was very easy, just like flowed right out.、Uh, and then the second one, in order to really do it justice、mm-hmm. and to really step into a type that is both very similar to me and yet also very different, I got feedback from a couple of INFPs.、Mm-hmm. So that helped、that's、in the, both writing groups. Especially to make sure that it was so funny in the first INFP story. So the INFPs, both of them, I'm thinking I've liked it, but they said that the character didn't suffer enough. Okay, I can understand that one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got okay.、Um, but it was actually good for me to go back because it was in the suffering that I found the character's true motivation,、mm-hmm. the actual like fire of the motivation to do something.、Yeah. That was like an exciting moment for me、yeah. when it just started to come out, and I'm like, oh, this, this is why the character will do this.、Mm, yeah. That's good. I, I appreciate that, and I'm sure it, it made it a deeper, richer story in many ways.、Um, I think INFPs have a threshold for suffering and wanting to explore the, these deep, dark e m o t i o n and pains. And、um, so. Got to get the hero up the tree and then throw rocks at them and make it tough on them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The other thing was that、um, I found in some stories that it's many small things that push the character.、Mm. It's like a, a bubbling up very slowly of many small things. And in other cases, it could be just one big thing、mm-hmm. like that hits them all of a sudden out of the blue. And then they're like, oh, I need to do something. Yeah. And that just pointed to like two different ways we can be faced with change. It's a matter of getting to that threshold of something has to change. I've got to be the one to do it. It's got to happen now. If it's going to happen in the future, then it's not going to happen. If I'm waiting for the world to do it for me, then it's not going to happen.、Um, yeah. I,、uh, maybe a quick question based off、mm-hmm. um, your process of creating the characters and I guess the end of that. Did you learn? Something about yourself through creating these stories about the characters? Because usually,、um, my impression is you、mm. do the neuroscience and the scientific, like T I T E facets of it.、Um, but then going yeah, into a、yeah. more like a heart space, I wonder if、mm. uh, you learned something about yourself in the process from embodying these characters more. Yeah, yeah.、Um, I, I have written some fiction on the side for many years, so I didn't、right. go in completely blind with it. A little bit of I enjoy writing science fiction and fantasy, but sometimes just contemporary. And almost all of the stories here are contemporary. Okay.、Um, I would say something, I, I try to be fair with every type. And in fact, there's even an extra chapter towards the end of the book that highlights three characters that are meant to be challenges、mm. for us to like those characters、okay. or to like the systems that they are a part of. I feel like type holds a certain bar to us. You know, it, it doesn't arrange people in a vertical hierarchy.、Mm-hmm. Type presents us with a palette of colors.、Yeah. And I don't want people to read a type and be like, oh, obviously the author doesn't like people of this type. Because、um, then I failed in my job as an author.、Mm. That I, I wanted to show, like, maybe not in its best light, but to humanize.、Mm-hmm. 
So all of the characters make mistakes, like they all have limitation. That's the nature of type, the human. even in the theory. Um, but to humanize them, and, and along the way, I do discover um, that some types are harder than others that I need to put in. And sometimes it's because I don't have enough experience with a certain type. Mm. I don't know a lot of SJs, but I know enough <laughs> to limp by. Um, and so it's like overcoming those biases mm -hmm. uh, as well, that maybe I had bad experiences with certain types and then how to present that in a way that's still very fair to that character. Mm. Um, and even one story, so with the second ISFP, I really felt like, oh, I'm being so hard on this character. Like people may view him, especially if they're not also IP types, as sort of a do-nothing depressed loser. Mm. Actually, when people read it, they said he was, of this because the two writing groups, they read almost all the stories, that he was actually the character that knew himself the best. Oh, interesting. He had like the most like self-awareness. Mm. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so that's, so I, I succeeded yeah. in that sense. Um, and then the other was just being reminded that for myself, yeah, the technical stuff is fun. But if I were to do more stuff, like what excites me to do more number crunching, to discover more from the brain imaging research, mm. or to write more stories. Mm. And I had a client just come today um, for brain imaging. It was actually her second time after four years. And she's an English uh, professor okay. and has really shifted in towards her in her NF preferences to going from like the standard instruction that's expected for her to cover to encouraging creativity. Mm and writing and so on is part of every class. And just the way she described it, and then this experience of writing the stories reminded me to get back to my own passion. And in the projects I have ahead of me, wondering what do I want to do next, to go back to my... So I, I've written two like 1930s horror novellas, and I've been working on a third one. It's just been sitting there for like a year and a half, waiting for the past couple, the last few chapters to finish. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, that's what, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to that mm. because actually that's where my excitement is. And the TE part of me, the extroverted thinking part, that's just, oh, you don't want it to be too much longer than the other books. Uh, or it needs to fit into the super certain like mechanical rubric or sure. whatever. Because um, they have a little bit of an element of choose your own adventure. They're not choose your own adventure, but they have an element. Yeah, of they that. are fun. Um, I enjoyed those books. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so it's, this is the third one in the series and following an ENTJ. Uh -huh. um, but this time you're playing the villain. Ooh. And that's, you're playing the, yes. Um, and how to make her sympathetic. Of course, she, because she's sympathetic, she can't be the final villain. Mm. It was like Darth Vader. Darth Vader wasn't the final villain. Mm. Um, we never find out like what dehumanized the emperor, at least not in the movie. Mm. So there, there must be some other villain. But in any case, it's just been a joy to write that and like discover that character. Yeah. And to just be like, okay, I'm going to just write the extra chapters and then I will step back and ask myself when I'm all done, okay, now how might I want to edit it? Like not try to force it as I go. And it was the same with a lot of these stories. It was just like starting to get the idea, just sit down and write and trust the process. Yeah. The, the writing group will give me feedback that I'll go away for a few days afterwards and come back and tweak a few things. Yeah, I mean, to trust creativity. Mm, that's good. My, my ENTJ friend told me before that he writes, <laughs> he's been writing a story for many years now, um, yeah. and he does art and things like that. And he, yeah, he said that he does it because he, he feels like he needs to give back to the well of creativity. Like, he, mm. he's taken so much inspiration and ideas and insights, and he needs to, like, return the favor. Um, and I thought that was a very interesting way of looking at you know, creativity in the process and how it is necessary to actually <laughs> to create and to give back and to do these things. Because I myself, I've found that um, as I've, uh, I was going to say matured in type, but adjusted my type and I've had mm -hmm. to focus on business and family and organization and a lot of TE commander things, a lot of my creative pursuits have had to be put to the side. and. I noticed that, and this is something I advise clients and everybody else in my community too, is that's so important, especially for INFPs, but for everybody is to like indulge in stories and creating these things that are expressions of yourself um, or different parts of yourself, different facets of yourself. I can sympathize with the, the demands of the world requiring <laughs> a certain amount of 
uh, compromise <laughs> sure. and, and pushing ourselves in development. And um, so one thing that came out of writing the stories, which actually ended up going back to decode your mm -hmm. personality, is um, that I ended up writing vignettes for Decode Your Personality. So vignette is not a case study and it's not a story. It's like somewhere in between. So because it's like four, four types, four subtypes or four variants of each type, to take one of those types, and I took ISFP and simply wrote like a day in the life of each one but in a little bit of like a story kind of style. Um, they don't face anything huge or life-changing, but it still illustrates the type. And I really feel like going forward in all of my type materials, I want to put in illustrative stories. Yes. yes. Um, because that's so much of the type community is about, well, originally with Jung, it was about therapy. Mm -hmm. The whole point was like, identifying the one-sidedness in the person so we can assist them in the alchemical process of transformation mm -hmm. therapeutically. Mm. Uh, and then somewhere that got lost. Um, <laughs> and then people just spend time on the internet arguing about these finer points of definitions. Sure. Which celebrity um, is which type. Yeah, yeah, as, as if somehow we can know. And having met some celebrities, I would say some people might be surprised because some, you know, they're hired to be actors and they also, even if they're not actors, they have media personas. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just because the average person, yeah, doesn't have that a sort of honed and toned example that they can put out to the world. There are people who have that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just stories are a different way for people to remember and, and not to pick apart the stories analytically, although I did think and I went back at times and wanted to make sure like, oh, does this have enough SI as the third function yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, they really just it's a different, more holistic, more organic, natural way mm. of learning about type. It's like, just remember the character as if they were someone in your life. And that becomes an example. Sure. Yeah, that's. Yeah. That's so I, I hope it will inspire other people to, to, to write stories. I'm sure it will. I get a lot of comments of people that are like, I'm writing a, an INFP character and I needed to understand more about their motivations or why they struggle with this thing or think like this. And they watch some of my videos and they're like, oh, now I get it. And now I can make them suffer more mm. or whatever their intention is with the <laughs> be true to the type. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We talked a little bit about the stereotypes of personality types mm -hmm. and how people mm -hmm. like focus on the memes or understanding a celebrity or character based off that type. Um, how can we use the different subtypes, which I think maybe you want to explain a little bit before, uh, mm -hmm. to get a clearer understanding so that we can decode the personality and not just stick with all the mm. stereotypes. So do you want to talk about yeah, the different um, subtypes first or how that came about? It's one of those stories that's sort of long and convoluted okay. and many things happened at once over the years. Um, to put a long story short, I was invited to the Socionic Seminar and asked to contribute some stuff about brain imaging and we were going to focus on ENFJ. Mm. And I just sorted the ENFJ results into four groups. I had already done this with a couple of other types on my own. Um, and it just matched so well with the subtype model that already exists in socionics, which is dominant, uh, creative, normalizing, and harmonizing. Um, so with Victor Galenko's permission, I've used those terms. Um, he does have a book out in English, uh, even though he himself usually presents in Ukrainian uh, or Russian. Um, I think Ukrainian. And it was that was one of those lines of inspiration. And what really struck me was that there are these the folks who become aware of socionics or they come from that background and they say, oh, this is the right way to do type. Mm. And then there are the Myers-Briggs people and the, the Jung people, and they're all a little bit different from each other. And what Victor managed to do, just from years of observation as a psychologist, was that there, there are, in socionics, there are some types, like say ISFP or ISFJ. Mm -hmm. and in fact, mostly the IS types don't match up. When you read the descriptions, they don't look like the descriptions in the Myers-Briggs, mm. like Western version. Mm -hmm. uh, and why is that? Um, and so some people will say, well, it's because Myers-Briggs is wrong or whatever it is. Well, no, they're still describing people and people relate to those types. So it can't be wrong. Right. What's going on? And Victor pointed out that if you talk about, say, four variants of ISFP, among those four variants, you will find the Western stereotypical variant. So like the Isabel Myers version of ISFP or David Kiersey version of ISFP is creative or harmonizing. Okay. 
And then you look at the Socionics version of ISFP, and by that I mean like ISF. I don't know. I don't want to get into all the sure. code and stuff yeah. like that, but they code slightly differently. Um, is very much like the Socionics version, the dominant and the normalizing okay. ISFP. So really what we're talking about is just because people have observed for cultural reasons, for individual idiosyncrasy, all of that, there are just different stereotypes mm -hmm. of these folks. And by having 64, we create like a space. So instead of people arguing over, is this blue, is this navy blue, or is this turquoise, mm -hmm. they can actually then have a framework to say, actually both of those colors are allowed and, and are there. Um, there's not just one kind of blue. Yeah. And I found that very powerful. That really opens up a lot of space. And it gives permission, for example, for people with a sensing preference to be creative. It makes understandable people with intuiting preference who ended up in, say, very conventional jobs mm -hmm. to see, like, where they are yeah. and things, to understand that everybody and anybody could be in a leadership position. Mm -hmm. That um, when working one-on-one, -on -one, this is a story Linda Behrens, Dr. Behrens, told me years ago. She studied under David Kersey. She was a graduate student in psychology, marriage, and family therapy. And she, as soon as she learned about type, she's like, oh, no, I'm an INTP. I, I shouldn't be a therapist because INTPs have terrible people mm. skills. And David Kersey was like, no, that's not the case because I'm a therapist and INTP. Yeah. And he said, you actually come with different gifts. Like yes. you have objectivity. You have analytical models. Like you can reach and understand people in a different way if you work at it, if you work at mm -hmm. it, than say an INFJ would. Mm -hmm. And that gave her like the oomph to be like, oh, okay, there's a different way to do my profession and that I can do this. Yeah. And so I want to in part let people know that no matter what space you're in, and I call them subtypes because that's convenient. It's easy for people to understand, but they're not smaller boxes. Right. They're just like developmental paths. And the neuroscience, not just me, other people points to, yeah, you put in those extra couple years of work, you change your environment, you change your activities, you practice, mm -hmm. you can change. Yes. You can go from normalizing to creative or to dominant or to harmonizing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we all have that within us. Mm. There's a lot of benefits besides helping people just be able to recognize their type. Yeah. I, so many times a person, like very early on, there was an INFJ. He really felt he was an INFJ, but he sometimes wondered, oh, maybe I'm really an INTJ because I'm not into all of this like artsy, fartsy, mystical uh -huh. INFJ stuff in these descriptions. And I'm actually like started my own tech company. Mm -hmm. And then just understand, like, oh, there are different versions of INFJ. Yeah. There's an analytical version. There's a dominant version. There's more than one way to show up as your type. Mm -hmm. And to give him permission to be an INFJ who is more analytical and dominant, that's just as there's INTJs who can be more, or, you know, whatever type. There's ESTPs. This is a joke. There are different kinds of ESTPs. And one of, one of them is, yes, the, sort of the Donald Trump type. And then there's the frat boy type. And then there's the, like, cool yoga teacher okay. type. And then there's the... They're, they come in all flavors, too. There's not just one, two, three different things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how does that show up? Mm -hmm. And to just give people the space to see, oh, yes, the, the relative, I'm not confused about their type. They're just actually this. Yeah. One thing that you said to me might have been two years ago now. I'm not really sure. It was, I think it was, there, there are an infinite number of ways to slice the human cake. And that always stuck with me because I was trying to figure out which name to use for this and how to define this. And um, oh, yeah, and yeah, just how you said that. I was like, oh, of course. Yeah, there's, there are so many different ways of looking at people and development and who they are and who they could be and all these different facets. Um, but it helps to have some structure instead of just assuming everybody is completely different. And then yeah, yeah. once we can refine it and then... Uh, expand on it in helpful ways. I think it's very good. So that, as you mentioned, uh, maybe an INFP is wondering, can I be, can I work in tech or can I be a leader or can I do this or this? Mm -hmm. My opinion is, of course you can, if you want to, if you work yeah. on it hard enough and if mm -hmm. it's aligned with your passion. And as you mentioned, you'll, they will bring in different skills to that process and the, the mm -hmm. job or the activity. Um, and I think that's what needs to happen for change, for the NE explosion of 
uh, innovation and potential and variations. Um, I think it's just, it's really helpful mm -hmm. for people to allow themselves to accept who they are, accept their, their personality type. A lot of people um, will say, oh, I tested out and I got INFP. Now what do I do? They're just, <laughs> they're depressed because they look up all these different explanations and memes and things like that. But um, there's so much potential with everybody to, to gamify it a bit, everybody playing their, their own unique character class. And within that, there are these four different or two different talent trees, or skill trees that they can go down. And that combination of how they've put in time and energy and experience and skills, um, I think really brings something extremely unique to the world and helpful as soon as... Mm -hmm we can get activated enough to do that, to, to bring it out into yeah. the world. With that, is there anything that, I know we're not going too deep into the different variants, is it possible for you to explain like how somebody could decide which one they are or should they work on mm. both? Um, or is that too big of a topic for <laughs> for this mm. conversation? I would say buy the book. Of course. Uh, you know, the, and for those of one brain, uh, I, I can't take okay. credit for the graphics, but a nice ENFP friend who does all of my graphics. Okay. Yeah. And so, yeah, go beyond Myers-Briggs mm. with 64 brain-based subtypes. Yeah. Uh, that is a thick book. And yes. Although it's not my thickest. And um, it's somehow my books keep getting longer over <laughs> the years, and that's concerned me. Yeah, what's the <laughs> next like, one going to be? Yeah, no, um, try and keep them smaller. Or, uh, you know, is the, the, the extroverted thinking part of me says very practically, it's like you can just cut a book in half and publish two books. Could. And then you get like the base profit of each one in addition, you know, to in people buying more. Mm. I'm like, yeah, oh, okay, but I also like to have everything in one place. Yeah. So some of the common questions people have. One is that I don't ask people to to pick something. And from the brain imaging, it's not, I mean, sometimes people are very clearly one. Mm. Uh, of the four, but in many cases, I think it's most productive to simply rank them okay. and and say, you know, what's first, what's second. So a person like creative first, harmonizing second. Uh, I can go to dominant sometimes. I can go to normalizing sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and then another is like, well, does it change? And I'm like, certainly it does. I mean, I always had this creative streak in me, but I do remember as a teenager and in my early 20s, like being very encouraged to be normalizing. Mm -hmm version, you know, to get my engineering degree, to get a job in engineering, to work, I would say nine to five, but engineers don't work that way in aerospace. Mm. They work them 60 or 80 hours a week, yeah. not 40. Um, and, and I'm happy I rejected that without really quite knowing why, because I knew that there, I had INTJ relatives or NT relatives in aerospace. Mm. And I knew, yes, that could be suitable for me, but it was never suitable. Mm. Like, I'm just not that kind of person. Yeah. Um, so the, it, it's absolutely fine to look back and, and see sometimes we've shifted. I, I think it's helpful to explore mm. the different spaces, but I also think opportunity plays a role. I'm not dominant subtype because I didn't do things that would allow that to happen, nor did I find opportunities. Nobody suddenly sat me down and put me in, say, a managerial position. Mm. And, and then I'm like, oh, I need to figure out how to be a manager. Yeah. Um, I didn't end up pursuing martial arts, which is a way also to like, as Helen Fisher would say, like boost the testosterone mm. that goes with the dominant subtype. Mm. She calls it something else, but it's the same basic idea. Um, so yes, people can change. And, and yet I also feel like there's this deep calling in each person for one of the four mm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, sort of very briefly to talk about them. So the dominant is more a, a more assertive and confident expression of your type, more more focused, more go-getter, um, more likely to be in a leadership position, and somebody who is comfortable, even if they're not in leadership position, of just like calling somebody who's a CEO and talking to them. Mm. Um, and I know a couple of INTJs who are like that, and that's not me. Yeah. Um, the creative is more, rather than testosterone driven, it's more dopamine driven. It's more curious, exploratory. Uh, it can come off being sociable, but that doesn't mean a lot of social skills. It just means like, oh, who are you and who are you? Um, and a and more like flexible, open approach to life. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean the person is necessarily doing art or music. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be the person is a traveler where they're an entrepreneur or something like that. 
Um, but there's some element of innovation and rebellion that happens there. Mm. So rather than playing a leader role, they might be, quote, a thought leader, but were like an artistic, like, leader in music, but really they're a rebel and an innovator mm. in some way. Okay. You think about, like, the leaders in music. Leaders in music are not people who are very conventional. Yeah. They're, the, they're all the ones who, like, broke shake new ground. Yep. Yes, shake things up, whatever it is. Um, normalizing is very serotonin-based. It's more conventional, more group-oriented, tends to be more specialized, uh, more mainstream. Mm. Uh, I, I think, I mean, you know, living in Japan, everyone is encouraged to be normalizing. Yes, very much yeah. so. Yeah, I mean, you can be as weird as you want inside of your home and on your free time, <laughs> yeah. right, in your head, uh, but you're supposed to present this, like, normalizing the appearance to the mm. world. Um, and serotonin is something that, that in all human beings gives us a sense of togetherness or community. Mm. That doesn't mean empathy or something like that, but even as, like, a normalizing INTP would say, the INTP actually cares about the success of the project and the success of the organization. Mm. And, and really that means like, I, they're seeing themselves as part of a group right? and wanting to, to make that go forward. Then there's harmonizing, which tends to be more reflective and empathic. And in my experience, also looking at people's demographics, more multicultural or sophisticated. Interesting. Um, and, and I think it's because to use INTP again, as an example, the, the if the INTP chooses human beings as their topic of study, mm. like how to do therapy, mm -hmm. not not just about therapy or like, you know, some distant statistical analysis, but to actually get in the thick of things with a person, th that's just a completely different, more challenging, muddy, gray, organic area to work in than, say, building motors right. for spacecraft or something like that. Not Not necessarily in the end more or less important, right. but it's something where the person just has to be more reflective, more open-ended, more organic, more in relation. Mm -hmm. And and so I would say that that's harmonizing is very much about being in relation. Well, I do stuff in psychology and I'm interested in that. I'm not, personally, I'm not a one-on-one -on -one kind of person. Mm -hmm. I make a terrible therapist. Um, my TE part of me is like, just get over it. <laughs> Suck it um, up, go. <laughs> <laughs> Suck it up. Right, right. Here, here's some tools. Use them. Suck right, it up. Yeah. I understand. I can stretch. I can learn some tools in that direction. Of course. And it's so remarkable to meet, it, say, an ESTJ who's harmonizing, which I have. Mm. And I know from the brain imaging data, even, like, they're harmonizing. Mm. Oh, they are so much more different than the stereotype of an ESTJ. Right. I mean, the, the basic functions, dominant function, auxiliary function, and so on, are still there. But the, the tone of everything, mm. they're like the diplomat rather than being the the army general sure yeah yeah the seasoning on top is different <laughs> yes yeah very much so yeah mm, that's fascinating um one thing that i'm sure people have already asked you and i get it a lot too is like should we work on our our weaknesses or should we focus on our strengths i have my own opinions about yeah. this but like in terms of your uh, your findings, is it helpful for people to like double down on what they're doing or to shore up some of the weaknesses yeah. so that they're not like, in, in my kind of way of thinking about it is we leak resources, you know, by, yeah. by having this weakness that hasn't been um, focused on or fixed or whatever it mm -hmm. is. And there are plenty of different ways of, you know, fixing that. You can get a partner who is a judger, mm -hmm. an ENFJ, that's going to take <laughs> yeah, care of those different aspects of your life. Or you can work on it yourself. But, like, has have you found anything um, interesting about should people focus on strengths or weaknesses or everything, mm. holistic growth? Or... Well, the one is that I would go back to Jung and his observation that generally how people do grow mm. in the first half of life is that they find a way to adapt to the world to be sufficiently successful in it, mm -hmm. regardless of what functions they're developing or what it, whatever. Mm -hmm. And in the second half of life, they have not just more freedom usually, but more ground mm -hmm. in order to actually come back and develop themselves in their truer sense. And mm -hmm. he, he didn't give this 
prescriptively, he more observed that this is typically what happens with people. You know, folks, they, they start sort of developing and they have to balance between like going to school and their parental expectations and all of this, along with their own personal desires. And then they end up in the workplace and maybe they get married and have children and there's all these demands. And so they have to basically learn extroverted thinking and introverted sensing and in some basic ways. And then at some point they start to get an itch that just no matter what they do, like doesn't go away. And they there's like, oh, there's these other parts of me that need to be addressed. Yeah. And and often that happens in the second half of life or the people have that opportunity mm. then. Um, that said, uh, I think it's very important to be aware of our strengths to make sure that we are, in fact, working from those and acknowledge those. I do also agree with Antonia Dodge uh, and just in general, even what Isabel Myers said, that working on our second function is a really great way to balance and improve the rest of who we are. I agree. So many people, especially young people, they just want to jump to their third and fourth function. And I'd be like, well, first of all, you're probably overusing your third function in certain <laughs> limited ways. Um, and then not developing it in others. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, this loop that happens between the first and the third function, yep. which is great because it's the inner child paired with the inner hero. And who doesn't like an adventure story with the hero and a child yeah. traveling together? Yeah. I mean, that's the Mandalorian and like a whole bunch of the other last stories. Of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. The Last of Us. Um, but somehow the parent, and, and in those stories, it's usually the parent that has, the good parent is gone. Mm. Yeah. Like the, the world has been destroyed, like the things that we can rely upon. And now only we face the shadow. Yeah. And, and that's a very compelling story, but it's generally not the story we live in in the real world. Yeah. And so just to develop more, and every time, I've thought like, oh, maybe my second function can solve this. And then I discover in literally like two minutes on the internet of Googling something. Yeah. It's some basic thing like, okay, so many people have extroverted thinking. Surely somebody come up with a business or plan or yes. idea that addresses my need. Yeah. Like some it just it has to be there. <laughs> yeah. A system, structure, business, like whatever it is. And yes, and then it turns out there's like 50 of them. Mm -hmm. And some of the, and of course, being that kind of thing, they're already rated and I already know who's more <laughs> or less successful and which one's the smart one to go. And before I know it, TE has solved the problem. Yeah. And and just the reminder, yeah, to, to do my second function. I would say very much for INFP and INTP, they can become very safe in their cocoon oh, yeah. of ideas and stories and mental models and all of that. And they may feel like they're using NE, but they're using it in a sort of a small way. Mm -hmm. And the big NE is a little bit like, do I dare break outside of this wonderful little castle I've created for myself? Uh -huh. And, um, or laboratory for INTPs, the thought lab. Sure. Um, the tower. The tower, <laughs> yes, yes. The other thing from the, the brain research that really strikes me is that when, when I sort of draw this diagram of the brain circuits that get active mm. and, and it's all just about the strong circuits are actually just the fast ones. Mm. So like every second or half a second or whatever it is for people who are really older and sort of slow, then it's like every two or three seconds. Mm. Um, have patience with those folks because their brains are literally operating at a slower clock speed. Mm. There's this ranking and when we're in conversation with somebody or we're doing problem solving, there's sort of an expectation that every three seconds, maybe four, like we're doing a back and forth and we're responding. And what if we can step back from that to allow the other circuits in our brain, not the slowest ones, but the ones that are like secondary strengths, mm. allow them time to catch up. It's amazing what happens when we just leave the room. Oh, I, I need yeah. you know, to pee for a moment. We go, we come back. And then like all of a sudden it seems like we've reset and have a new idea yeah. or can approach it differently or whatever it is. That's literally because your brain, not, not just your nervous system as a whole, which is also true. It's good to go to a different context and then mm -hmm. different environment and then come back. Um, but because the slower circuits in your brain have actually had a chance to like connect and fire together and do their work, mm -hmm. their contribution. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of fits with the second function, like the the slower functions, like the lower ones, like give them time to work their thing. Mm. I remember like for a couple of years, I took this acting prep course 
Um, I mean, he took an acting class, but most of the time it was just every Friday. And it, it was all about like being present with the other person mm. uh, in front of me that I'm working with. And in order to do that, as the teacher explained, I can't be bringing in a bunch of emotions from outside uh, in an unaware way. Uh -huh. I can bring them in aware sure. be, and those will come up. But in order to be in the scene or in the practice working off of the other person, I need to sort of be aware of what my baggage is. Mm. And literally, I would spend my 15-minute driving trip and the first 10 minutes of class sitting there asking myself, how do I feel? Yeah. How do I feel? How do I feel? <laughs> and just sort of like peeling the layers. Yeah. And it's like, well, I'm irritated. Why am I irritated? Uh, I'm frustrated. Why am I frustrated? I'm disappointed. Mm. Oh, I had an expectation about something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mad at myself. Um, and just sort of peeling away. And then it's amazing because in that process, it's like the emotions dissipate once you begin to recognize them. Yes. Yeah. And, and for me, that became like an introverted feeling practice every Friday. That's awesome. To like to be aware of them. Um, without living in that space all the time and think like, gosh, if I lived in that space all the time, that would be a lot of work. Um, <laughs> Could be. Could be. <laughs> just saying. I don't know. Just maybe. Saying, yeah. Being comfortable with that as a process. So I do think it's good to go lower down. In terms mm -hmm. of all of looking at all of the functions, um, yeah, I do think like having people in our lives that help cover for those. Uh, at the same time, don't assume that they can do that. Yeah. So right now I'm in a situation where I have to be like an ESTJ, basically, uh -huh. in one part of my life. Uh, some of that is fine. I can do extroverted thinking. But to be pushed into that, like, SJ space and to have to be there is, like, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Because the other person is expecting that I'm going to fill in for SI and TE. Right. Because they don't do those functions. Um, so I would say it's worthwhile in life to find the doorway with each function to allow it in to some extent. Mm. And I really believe... And, and the data, not just from me, uh, I mean, it's from Mark Majors and other people from assessment analysis, mm -hmm. that the sixth function is something that people can access and bring into their lives successfully. For INFPs, then that would be introverted intuiting. Yep. The, 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 and and I, it's, it's not a surprise when I go to a workshop that feels perfectly like a stereotypical, oh, this should be an INFJ topic, and a third of the people there are INFPs. Yeah. And actually, in the session, they are doing some introverted intuiting. Mm -hmm. And that's, they've incorporated that into their lives. Yeah. And now just starting to think recently about the fifth function and how that shows up, not just in our uh, other people, which I think is easy for us to see, yeah. but in ourselves and how unconscious it is. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that it can be a great gift and produce magic. Mm -hmm. But it can also be one of those behaviors that everybody is like, still, after 60 years, you're still doing that. <laughs> I have to process And the person doesn't idea. even notice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, and it took the group a while because our discussion group, we couldn't talk about our own type huh. because we realized we ha all of us had a blind spot about our own type. Like the fifth function is a serious self-blind spot. Yeah. And, and then so we really had to think about other people of different types. Mm -hmm. in order to begin to brainstorm around it, but to just even be aware of those. Um, and then the seventh and eighth, I, I'm just like, yeah. you got to cover for them somehow, yeah. or it's going to come back to bite you in some way. Yeah. Maybe, maybe not for the first 60, 70 years of your life, but it will come back to bite you. There's a lot to unpack with that. I imagine it, you know, as all these different characters, these different parts within your psyche and these different... Uh, two different questing parties or two different pirate ships. And, you know, the, the fifth function is the captain of that one pirate ship and you're the captain of the other. And they're, they're rivals. They, they can clash sometimes, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean they're enemies. You know, they, they're yeah, going for yeah. the same treasure, perhaps, but it doesn't mean they're always fighting the whole time. And once you can kind of appreciate, like, we're, we're trying to do the same thing. Like, for INFP's case, it's like we're both trying to do feeling stuff and mm -hmm. yet you're doing it this way and I'm doing it this way I'm doing it the right way but it's not you know it's not like that and there's a lot that you can learn and gain from the auxiliary function the second function it's completely changed my life like going mm. into Japan when I was in Michigan oh, yeah. and everything was you know I, I 
did not go on my senior trip to Spain, I believe it was, because I was too afraid. Mm -hmm. Like, I was too uncomfortable. I was so shy and, you know, held back, and, and I made it to Japan somehow, and it drastically changed everything. I've been here for 17 years because of it, and I have a family. Like, that would not have mm -hmm. happened if I stayed in Michigan. Something would have hopefully happened, but I don't know how I would have developed. Um, mm. But forcing myself to be in that context where I didn't know the language, I didn't know the culture, I didn't know the people, everything was, I had to figure it out in this kind of baby mode of like, I don't know how to do anything in this culture and I can't even communicate it and having to like find the, the easiest route to say things with my limited vocabulary really helped, I believe, um, my development in, mm. in so many ways. And now I... It, it's funny. Mm. Yeah, no, please. Um, I was going to go on to oh, NI, yeah, I, but was, yeah, if you got something about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I was going to say, um, it's funny that you ended up choosing a culture which has a lot of value around introverted sensing, which is your third function. And one of the things that is in Decode Your Personality is not the subtypes. Um, I mean, th there is that, but it's a discussion of the third and fourth function. And the third function as what I sort of call like our neurotic boundary or mm. neurotic zone. And then the fourth function is our hidden aspiration. So to, to, to combine what you said with your earlier question about like, where do we go from here yeah. kind of thing. Uh, one is to under, like the reason I call it neurotic boundary is not because the third function is only that, but because there is always a boundary between the ego and the unconscious. Yeah. And or boundary like a zone. And, that zone is often filled with material from the third function, not just the third function, but a lot of it goes there. Mm -hmm. And that boundary, that gray zone can often be very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And Jung meant neurosis in the most broad sense of the term. Mm -hmm. Like it covered a lot of different things, whether it's OCD or ADD or whatever things we want to name today. Yeah. And, and yet it's also the source of where the growth occurs. Yeah. And so to keep confronting that zone and being aware of it, um, knowing that a lot of the material in it is third function material and being frustrated by it at times, like, oh, why has this come up again? Yeah. Oh, did I do that again? Yeah. Like whatever it is. And yet also understanding that that's, we wouldn't grow without that boundary. Mm -hmm. And the, the otherwise, like how do things cross over? Or it's just the ego doing like a growth plan, sure. which is then not really growth. Yeah. Um, and then the fourth function, so one is just noticing that and understanding like that's a place where you can get your growth from. And then the hidden aspiration ties into that idea of like the first and the fourth working together mm -hmm. and partnership. And in, instead of saying like, which function should I focus on in my career or something? Not that you said that, but like somebody might say that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The question is really, how can I bring together my first and fourth function? Yeah. And, and what are examples for my type? Like, what does that look like mm -hmm. for my type? Mm -hmm. and, and just to give, like, some examples from, where is INFP here? Of course, out of the 16 types, for some reason, INFP I always put last. I've noticed that. Because um, it's the most special. Yeah. Um, it's just like this. Well, what is the, this hidden aspiration looks like? And it's like, yearning to channel their deeply felt emotions and convictions into a productive life. Mm -hmm. Establish a nonprofit, design a set of tools or methods or a platform, follow a strict training regime, or manage an effective business venture. Aims that align with your values. Yep. So it's actually like doing something. Like Isabel Myers, INFP, like started an organization and created a type instrument and did these things that like were meant to be like effective and actually make her ideals come into fruition. Um, Enjoy producing creative compositions and art and music and so on that they can put out into the world. Yeah. I do think that there's an aspiration, even if many of the stories or whatever don't make it, they want to. Yes. Like they yes. want to know that their painting or their art or whatever is like being experienced and appreciated. There's that TE sort of drive to do something with it. Love to see objective validation, such as scientific measures. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's one thing to like to have beliefs and like an impression of the convictions, we'll say, but then to have like data behind those convictions yeah. is like an extra like, I mean, that just makes it so much more delicious, doesn't yes. it? When yes. it's when it's there. 
uh, harbor a hidden drive for effective organization, objective structure, and impactful execution. So it's like a hidden drive. Mm. And, and that doesn't mean in all their day-to-day -day life that's going to happen, but it's some level in their life yeah. to see that happening. Um, and then can occasionally become overly critical or fixated on success metrics or maybe subtly controlling. <laughs> can be. I mean, yeah. there's nothing more surprising to people than the INFP or ISFP who suddenly goes from being that like very flexible go with the flow yeah. to all of a sudden speaking with the, the uh, what is it, the, the voice of the general um, damning you to oblivion kind of thing <laughs> or like telling you exactly what sure. you need to do and yeah. why. Micromanagement. Um, and that's that, yeah, yeah, that, that TE voice suddenly comes out. Yeah. And, and so those are ways and like to understand, like here, these are just examples, but, but what can it look like that will be really satisfying? Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I felt all of those examples. <laughs> I was like, yep, I know that one. I know that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know that one. Yeah. 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 Even just going through the process of writing the different types made me realize why so many SPs are involved with like uh, physically oriented self-help activities, mm. like yoga classes or uh, outdoor adventure team building yeah. or whatever it is, because the NI hidden drive for personal development mm. combined with the love of physical activity, right. even something if it actionable. means like, okay, yeah, something actionable. Um, even if it's like, a, like this famous show about people tr like trying to build their own business, mm. And like who was more or less successful at that and then whether or not they would get fired or they would right. survive to the next week. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, that actually is an S-E-N-I mm. dynamic that's there. It's like pushing the people to grow and develop and be the most that they can be. Right. Yeah. Well, at the same time, being very S-E concrete and, and like uh, tangible. tangible. Yeah, you got to know that it actually happened. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is one of the one of the biggest difficulties that I I hear from clients and everybody else is that uh like I, I maybe this is for everybody, but I know specifically INFPs struggle with it too. It's like, what do you want? How, what's the goal? And it's like, well, I'll know when I I feel it. Like it'll feel mm -hmm. this way, or maybe it's not even yeah. usually expressed that much. It's just like I'll I'll feel it, and really adding some sort of uh, tangible component to it or some metrics uh, is mm -hmm. so hard, uh, even for myself. Yeah. But it is one of those things that really gets it going and, and makes sure that mm -hmm. you are actually making progress. Cool. Um, is there anything else that you want to cover before uh, we wrap this up? No? I, I think that does it, yeah. yeah. Thank you for the interview. That's, Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I hope that uh, through these that more people will encounter type where this is like especially the teaching tales book i'm like oh this is a book i can actually give to some people who would not normally be interested in type mm. yes or that they 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 can give it to their relatives or something yeah. and at least they'll be like oh those were fun stories and they get the idea of diversity of people yeah there's so much you can yeah. learn from stories and so i really appreciate that you've gone down this path at least for this book and you know some of your other mm -hmm books but this is more like grounded in the 16 personality types of course um, yeah and yeah there's just so many ways that you can see somebody else or read about their story and then internalize different aspects of it and parts of it to learn about yourself or people in your life and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the more you know the more flexibility you have and the ability to adjust and adapt and do the things that make the world a better place i suppose so yeah 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 cool um, yeah, and I could definitely talk about story more and more. So if that's something that you want to do later, we can talk about maybe your creative process for writing these stories and we can unpack that because I know a lot of people in this channel would like to hear that too. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would love to. And in fact, I believe Type School, yeah. uh, which is, you know, another organization that you and I know about mm -hmm. it, right? They've talked about having like a writing class, yeah, like a type and writing That'd be class. Fun. And what would, yeah, I think that would be really fun. Um, and yeah, it's, it's such a, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be a novel. It can be three pages. Or it could be a giant yeah, tome, yeah. but yes, it could, it could it, start it, it out it with just a couple, too. a sentence. Yeah. 
Yes, that's right. Yes. And then there were none. <laughs> Wait, that's an Agatha Christie story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Yeah. Start. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining. Um, decode your personality and teaching tales for the 16 personality types. I will I'll hold them up in my imagination. Thank you. Yes, I see them there. <laughs> yes. I'll put the links down below. Everybody, please check out the books. Learn more about yourself and the people that you love in your life and uh, bring your gifts to the world. So thank you very much, Dario. Wonderful. Thank you as well, Matt. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Cheers. <laughs>